okay, my success story. Um, this is a success story from uh, a company called DSTO in Australia, which have been working together with Maycom. DSTO is a defense agency, but uh, Maycom, as you probably all know, uh, manufactures components for cell phone and military uh, applications. And therefore, their angle of interest was a little bit different. But the point here was that when phased array antennas become popular, either for line of sight connections in the base station infrastructure or for the base station itself at higher frequencies, gallium arsenide that is traditionally used for this kind of applications is quite expensive. So the goal was to look at a cheaper way of making these elements. Because if you have a base station antenna with 168 elements, then the price per element is quite relevant in a commercial market. So the goal was to design a SIGI, silicium germanium, HPT uh, receiver in this case, at a 0.13 micron process, and get the kind of parameters you need for a communication at these frequency bands. Now, because there was a defense kind of uh, influence in this project as well, they made it broadband, but it was a more wide proof of concept study. So this is the design. The dimensions are 2.5 millimeters by one millimeter. And basically it looks like this. We have the RF input here, followed by a few amplifier stages and inductances. That's what these uh, large circles are. Next, we mix this with the INQ channel and amplify this so that we get uh, basically a differential output. The software used for this project is Analog Office, and Analog Office is basically the same product as Microwave Office, with the only difference that Analog Office is for RVIC design. So it has a few capabilities that you typically don't need for PCB design, like DRC, LVS, and that kind of stuff. So with this RFIC design flow, the customer has optimized or basically uh, developed the design kit because with RFIC design, you use design kits. All the components you use are already developed and you can drag and drop them in. That has to be done because with an RFIC process, there is no infinite number of different components you can pick from. It's not like buying a Murata or a TDK inductor, you really have to stay to the conductor that is developed for this process. We're going to look a little bit closer at the P-cells because this design has been made with a P-cell approach. And what do I mean with that? Well, if you have an Emlin in microwave office and you give it 10 millimeters of length and 2 millimeters of width, then automatically the layout for this Emlin is drawn in the software. And that is really what a P-cell is. A P-cell is a parametric cell, a layout cell, that is drawn automatically based on the dimensions you give it in the schematic editor. So this P-cell approach means that we have an inductor here, we give it a number of windings and a width, and it automatically draws the layout. When you change it to eight, eight revolutions, then suddenly the layout automatically updates. So that's what a P-cell approach is. Now the power in AWR is that it's only a few clicks of a mouse button to get this P-cell into the EM simulator. And I think I better show that in the software, so I will try to do that. So I have uh, opened the project here, and as can be seen in the top of the, of the window, it says between square brackets DMMSG13, which is basically uh, to show that I have loaded a PDK in this project. And I will start to create a new schematic and call it transformer. So, and next I will go to the library that is created by this user and you can find it on the X libraries. X libraries basically means that it's an XML based library. And typically if you would use a PDK from a foundry, then this PDK will end up under X libraries, but the same applies if you make P cells yourself. Uh, in this case, I will use one from a self-made library called DMN-SG13. But if you would look at, for example, uh, the SG13 library here, and I take a look at an inductor, you can see that the layout is automatically created based 
on this cell. So if I change, uh, for example, the width of this line from 50 to 40 microns, then this automatically updates. As you can see in the layout. But that's not what I'm going to use now. So back to the customers library and you find it under DMM. Go to transformers. And in this case, I'm going to use an orthogonal transformer. So I drag that in to the schematic here. And once again, you can see that it automatically um, shows up in the layout. Now, when I change something, a dimension of this P cell to, for example, the top radius to 40 microns, the layout synchronizes. So there is no need for manual synchronization. The layout and the schematic are connected. Um, and that's one of the, the key advantages that AWR has in, in the software, not only for this example, but for any uh, PSO component that we have. So that means that you can basically optimize, you can do yield analysis, all these things, varying dimensions and maintaining uh, synchronity between the layout and the schematic. Now, because I have this automatically created layout, I can actually very easily send this over to the M simulator. And that is one of the unique powers in our software environment. So I will show you how to do that. Um, I don't have to add ports now, but uh, if I don't add ports, you won't see ports in the M simulator. So right now I will do that. Add ports to the transformer and I add a so-called extract block. And that is basically AWR's way of telling the software that you don't want to use mathematical or closed form models for the transformer, but you want to do an EM simulation. And you will find in the PDK quite often there isn't even an electrical model. In this case, for the transformer, there is no electrical model because to create the electrical model is uh, quite a lot of work and you need to do an EM analysis anyhow, because EM is just more accurate. It has a broader frequency span. It has much more variety in what kind of line widths and so on you can use. So therefore it's uh, only an EM model. So I entered this extract block. You can uh, set the simulator. In this case, I will use Axiom. And the X and Y cell size is basically an indicator for the meshing. And as a rule of thumb, you can take about one fifth of uh, the smallest width. And here, the top width of the, the circle is seven microns. So let's put this to two. It's not very important in this case, but okay. So finally, I have to tell the software what I would like to extract. So I double click in the transformer and there's a tab called model options. And there I can activate EM extraction. So I do that, okay, and I cross check. And you see that the inductor or the transformer now highlights, meaning that it's selected. So next step is I will uh, go over, let's take a look at the 3D as well, yep. So now I will send it to the M simulator by right clicking on the extract block and choose extraction. And there it is, including all the ports. And this is the EM simulator, as you can see, Axiom. I can also take a look at the meshing. So here in the project tree, you under EM structures, you will find this EM document. So I click on mesh and here's the meshing. It's not over meshed, it's not under meshed. It's perhaps, well, slightly under meshed perhaps. But um, now if I change something, a dimension, as I mentioned earlier, let's say I make this uh, top radius 35 again, and I click on add extract again, then, the EM document is automatically updated. And once again, I can look at the mesh as well. It doesn't rematch automatically the whole time because that would um, require quite some computing power. And it's not sure that you want to see that. So that's why I have to click on mesh again. And this basically allows you to do optimization based on the P cells. And it also allows you to um, do yield analysis and things like that. Now, if I want to model this more accurate, I can also go into the EM simulator settings in the extract block here, because the extract block controls the EM simulator. And you can take a look at the mesh. And if you look, for example, at model as zero thickness, that basically means that we assume the conductors to be infinitely thin. But in this case, the width of the line is quite 
uh, small in comparison to the thickness. Um, normally, as a rule of thumb, you could say if it's more than 20% thickness compared to the width of the line, then you should take thickness into account. Uh, that's just a rough rule of thumb. There's much more to consider. But uh, And I do a re-extraction again. Then you can see that the simulator now is meshing in the set direction as well. And also important, if you look here in the 3D view of the cell, you can see firewalls here. And these firewalls, if you would have to mesh them individually, that requires enormous computing power and it's not really necessary. So what the software is doing now is it basically translates this whole wall of vias with a lot of meshing details into one single brick. And that's done with something called shape pre-processing. You can find it here under the settings for the EM simulator, but more about that in my, uh, simula uh, in my presentation. First of all, when you have such an EM block and you want to optimize it, you can imagine that having like 1000 optimization steps would take a lot of time. So AWR has a way of taking a sweep with very large steps and once you did that, you can allow the software to interpolate all the simulation results that are reasonably in between. So you optimize, for example, 20 steps and you can simulate an infinite number of steps in between. That's basically done automatically, so you don't have to think about it. But what it really does is it creates the S parameters for the steps that you picked and it will create a model by means of uh, MDIF, which is basically just a bunch of S parameter files, and it allows you to interpolate in between. So having models like the transformer or the inductor doesn't mean you have to EM simulate them the whole time. You can interpolate and create models. So a little bit more about one of the components here, the RC filter. Uh, that's a filter that is based, located here in the middle, or on this side here. And we apply a few techniques here. First of all, the customer did an optimization here of the length, the feed lines of this filter, because the filter pods are I and Q. They had to be isolated. So what the customer did is they had a ground layer in between to isolate the two pods, and they optimized the length of the conductors so that the phase difference would be minimal. They also applied z-direction meshing or they deactivated infinitely thin metal. The reason to do that is because the width of the line is quite small comparison to the thickness and therefore the thickness of the material is quite relevant. And finally they applied shape pre-processing rules and these are quite important to remember. These are rules to simplify your EM structure. It's quite important because in this case, we reduced the number of unknowns for the same project with a factor of four, I believe, just by taking away unnecessary mesh cells, like here. You have many cells and that's not needed. So you use shape pre-processing rules to simplify the structure. We have built-in DRC and LVS, and I briefly mentioned that before. DRC is design rule check, meaning that you apply rules to the design minimum width of a line, minimum spacing, minimum distance between vias, minimum diameter of a via, and so on. That's very important when you have designs with many components, which silicium germanium most of the time is. We also have connections with external DRC and LVS tools. So if we look at the filter here, you can see the filter performs well. The bandwidth in this graph is much more than what it was in reality or in the design goal, uh, so between the design frequency it's pretty flat compared to the ideal model that we can see with the black lines, both in angle and also in magnitude. 